Welcome back. Previously on Concepts of Physics. I always wanted to do that. Anyway, um, we'd been talking about motion. Specifically, we'd got into this idea of acceleration, that acceleration is the rate of change of velocity. So now it is important to note here that these little arrows, not just for health's sake, these are vector quantities. Acceleration is a vector because change in velocity is a vector. We, you know, if vectors are equal to vectors. Not really important. Anyway, point is, just like velocity was the change in position of an object, the rate of change in position of an object, or the change in position over the change in time, the rate of change of velocity is acceleration. Same kind of relationships. We talked about how we, when we, what we expect this to look like. We had said that you know, if we have a position curve, we expect it to have this kind of, we expect it to be a curve actually, because down here, we can see we have one velocity. If we kind of zoom in super far, we can get a kind of tangent line. The slope of this line looks flat, whereas if we come over here at the tail end of it, the slope of this line looks pretty steep for some little chunk of it. So we can ask the kind of question, what is the displacement of a constantly accelerated object? When it was moving at constant velocity, we knew that the displacement looked like the velocity times the time. And so we know that we can kind of go from a velocity to a displacement, so let's see what we can do here. We're going to give this a shot. So here, I have an example of constantly accelerated motion, and it's a velocity graph for this. I know it's constant acceleration because I have a constant slope. I can see I'm starting at some v naught, and I'm going to start calling this v aux, not actually v aux, v naught x, um, for some day when we move maybe in the y direction. So we can be specific here for going horizontally or vertically. And it's going to end with some different velocity, vx. And this is a hallmark of acceleration. If we're changing velocities, acceleration had best be happening. We're going to start at time t equals 0, because we can kind of start our stopwatch whenever. Start our stopwatch. Good English. All right. And we're going to end at some time t that is just plain old t. Not to be confused with the axis t, even though that's confusing. Now, before we had said that the displacement looked like the area under the curve. so. We want to find this area between the time axis and the velocity curve. One thing that's important to note, because this curve is above the time axis, I expect this to be a positive area. So I'm moving forward, which is good. Um, but you know, it's now a trapezoid, right? And I know about you, but I never remember how to find the area of a trapezoid. It's not entirely true. I actually remember how to find the area of a trapezoid, but let's assume that I don't. Now, you may be stumped. You may be thinking trapezoids are terrible shapes, but never fear. I have a strategy. Trapezoid is just a triangle up here shoved on top of a rectangle down here. Now that I've thoroughly destroyed that, let's just move on to kind of talking about this. We can think of it as a triangle up on top plus the area of a rectangle down below. And so look, let's look at this triangle. This triangle, I can ask what is its height, right? The height of the triangle over here looks like it's Vx minus V naught X. And the base of it looks like it is T. So the area of the triangle should look like one half base times height, which I recognize this, this, v net, this vx minus v naught x, my final velocity minus my initial velocity is just delta v. And now here's where I'm going to be incredibly clever and try to get the acceleration in. I know that delta v, x always in this case, over delta t, and delta t in this case is just plain old boring t, right? This is my acceleration. So delta v x equals a x t, which I can just make that substitution. And now I see the area of the triangle is 1 half a x t squared. The area of the rectangle, mercifully a little easier to do. The height of this thing is just v naught x. The base of it is just t. 
So the area of the rectangle is just, I guess this time I wrote it base times height. One way to think of this, the triangle is the extra distance we're covering because we're accelerating. This rectangle below would be if we were at constant velocity v naught x. But since we are speeding up, we're going this extra distance that the triangle is measuring. So the total area is going to be the sum of these, or v naught v naught x t plus one half a x t squared. And since the area is the displacement, remember from last time. This means that delta x is equal to this stuff, or x minus x naught, which is delta x, is equal to this stuff, or, and this is the version we're usually going to see, x naught, nope, x equals x naught plus v naught t plus one half a t squared. This would be where I'd be if I didn't move at all. My velocity was zero and my acceleration was zero. This is where I would be if my acceleration were zero, if I were moving at constant velocity. And then this is the term that gets me, that captures that accelerated motion. So you gotta get the same idea that we keep talking about in physics of building more complexity in it. First we can find a position, then we can allow a thing to move at a constant speed, a constant velocity. Should be an ox there, sorry. And then we can allow it to accelerate. Um, skipping some other math, let's come back in AP Physics. We can generate three kinematic equations. The one that we just talked about, this one, which should look familiar, this is just a fancy way to state the definition of acceleration. So I'm going to leave it to you to convince yourself that this is true. And then this one just comes totally out of left field. Um, until you start talking about forces and work in AP Physics. Um, but it is definitely true. Trust me. You might be wondering, how do I know when to use these? So this equation, this first one, doesn't talk about the final velocity. This equation doesn't talk about the displacement. And this equation doesn't talk about the time. So each of those help you clue into which equation you should use based on what the problem is telling you. So now what can we do with this? Consider the following problem. An electric vehicle starts from rest and accelerates at a rate of 2.0 meters per second squared in a straight line until it reaches a speed of 20 meters per second. How much time elapses during this process? So this is the process your book outlines for carrying this out. First step, sketch and translate. So what I've done here, I've sketched, I have my car, my object of interest, I've created a coordinate system, I've specified a positive x direction, an origin, and I've pulled out all of the information that I can from this problem. Crazy arrow style. I know it starts from rest, that's an initial velocity. I know it accelerates at a rate of 2.0 meters per second squared until it reaches a final speed, a final velocity of 20 meters per second. And I want to know how much time elapses. So that's my big question. Having pulled all this out, I want to now start putting some of our skills to use in diagramming this. I want to simplify it. I notice it's a constant acceleration problem. And I can represent the motion with a motion diagram like this, where it's speeding up, the velocity is getting larger at every time interval because there's a constant acceleration. Now we start to get to the, the new bit of this, and that's to represent this stuff mathematically. So quick recap, we don't know anything about the displacement, we don't know how long it takes, we know the initial velocity, the final velocity, the acceleration. We care about the time. We don't care about the displacement. So if I scroll back up to this thing, I can look at this and say, which one of these doesn't care about displacement? Aha. So this is the equation I want. So I'm going to take that equation, and now I'm going to manipulate it. I'm going to move my v naught x over. I'm going to divide by ax until I have t, which is what I want, equals stuff that I know. And that's stuff that I know. 
I always want to do this algebraically for two reasons. One, because it makes my life easier when I'm grading it. And two, because it lets you tell that things are still working. You can't, you know, you know that you're adding and subtracting velocities. You can't, it's an apples and oranges kind of thing. You can add apples to apples, you can add oranges to oranges, but you can't add oranges to apples in a meaningful way, unless you're making a fruit salad, I suppose. But who puts oranges in a fruit salad? Like, that's just weird. Anyway. Um, there are a lot of mathematical checks that you can have when you do this. They may not click for you now, but it's a very good habit to develop, so I'm going to force you to develop that good habit. And the last step of this is to solve and evaluate. Given this equation, we want to plug in our numbers. We know that the initial, the final velocity is 20 meters per second, the initial is 0 meters per second, the acceleration is 2 meters per second squared, giving us 20 meters per second divided by 2 meters per second squared, or 10 seconds. Now we can check this you know, the units of this are a little tricky because we have this whole complicated fraction thing. But we can remember a nice trick from math that dividing by a fraction is the same as multiplying by the inverse. So look at this. So now I have multiplication. I can simplify this thing into just one big fraction. A little easier for me to look at. A factor of meters on the top and a factor of meters on the bottom will cancel. I have meters divided by meters is one. A factor of seconds on the top and a factor of seconds on the bottom will cancel. Seconds divided by seconds is 1. So seconds squared divided by seconds just leaves me with seconds, which is good because I needed a time. Now, it's not just enough to solve this. We want to evaluate it to check our work because someday you got to take a test and you want to know at the end, at the end was it reasonable. So does this make sense? Quick, we can quickly check here. If you accelerate from rest at 2 meters per second for 10 seconds, how fast are you going? worth checking. One last application, uh, and that is talking about free fall. This is a special case where the acceleration is the acceleration due to gravity, or where the strength of the gravitational field, if you want to be very precise, and that is going to be taken as 9.8 meters per second squared. That's a very weird way to spell gravity. Um, so that's what your book is going to put it as. It's important to note, when you're doing free fall problems, both of the, so if I throw a ball up and then watch it come down, this ball is accelerating downwards. Oops, oh goodness, what am I doing? So this ball has an acceleration of g that is going downwards, and this ball has an acceleration of g that is going downwards. The whole time that that ball is being acted on just by gravity, it is in free fall, even when it is going up. Other than that, free fall problems are exactly like the constant acceleration problems we outlined before. So this should walk you through nicely sections 1-6, the back end of that, 1-7 and 1-8 in your book. We're not going to cover 1-9. It extends this to a very specific case, which makes for some good reading. Um, the kind of big new thing to worry about are these three kinematic equations that we're going to be using. You don't have to worry about memorizing them, but you do have to know which one to pull out when, uh, based on the problem you've got. We'll talk about this more in class, so, you know, look forward to that. Have a good one.